there was a good question today in the morning uh, regarding expectation sense of well even when we practice we we do have some expectation we need even some expectation that the uh, practice has a benefit and so it's important to make a difference between an expectation that can be an aspiration to practice that arise that can also uh, help arising energy that helps us to step into but then there can be an expectation that is there every step and that's too much so what it can be compared with like having the aspiration to climb a mountain and of course one wants to reach the peak but then, even if this aspiration is in the background and it energizes the whole thing, we have to go step by step. And there might be passages which are difficult and we have to see how to get through them. And there might be passages which, which are more easy, but maybe boring, and we just continue. But we don't think every step, oh, of, of the peak. We have to look what is just in front of us. And in the same way, similar way, it is uh, with the uh, Vipassana practice. Of course, there are benefits, there are great benefits. But we have to look step by step, breath by breath, moment by moment, whatever we meet there. This aspiration to step out and practice is in the Pali language called Chanda. And Chanda, it can be wholesome and can be unwholesome. But in that context, it, it is all wholesome because it, or sometimes it's called the desire to reduce desire. When we see that desire is uh, uh, and clinging is creating uh, uh, tensions and problems, the desire to reduce the desire, but not just this strong will, but through a process of insight. This is how it works. I read a small part of a text that is by Jack Engler about practicing for awakening, about Vipassana practice. Buddha Gosa, it's a fifth century commentator to the old Buddhist text, called practice a Visuddhi Magga, and that means a path of purification, purification of the mind, of the heart wholehearted as with pressures to unwittingly turn practice into another means of shoring up ego. From this initial mixture, the impurities are refined out in the fire of practice. But this requires intention, desire, the will to do, and this is the mental factor that the Buddhist Abhidharma calls Chanda. Without this will to do, without this desire or in, intention to awaken, awaken, awakening will not happen. I wanted to know the meaning of life, a student of a Zen teacher said. The Zen teacher replied, how did you ask your question? Only when you are driven to cry from your guts, I must, I will find out, will your question be answered? Aspiration can be confused with longing. Longing is only a wish for what we believe we will never have. Aspiration is setting out our face to the wind with conviction, purpose and intention. What we don't intend, we will not accomplish. So it's rather this intention, aspiration, and it may not be awakening for everyone. It may be simply to 
reduce a level of unease and suffering in life or uh, whatever it is. This is what in the first day I said, what is your aspiration? What is, why are you practicing? So to set out into the wind and aspiring actually insight, wisdom. This is what Vipassana is about. It is a wisdom practice. And it is the development of wisdom that does eradicate the sources of suffering. It's not that all the sources of suffering are other people or is outside there. The Buddha very clearly states that it is in each one's heart and mind. A sense of, well, not really seeing truth of uh, existence, having wrong ideas. So, today I want to speak a little bit about Vipassana and shine a light on whether what we do here, is it true Vipassana or is it just called Vipassana? <laughs> because Vipassana means uh, seeing from different angles, but it also means something like, well, uh, it, it is defined as seeing seeing with the heart, seeing directly the so-called universal characteristics of existence. And this doesn't start just while we sit down and say, now I practice Vipassana. It, there is some kind of preparing work to do. And this preparing work is not something that is uninteresting, it is already very interesting. It's already a turning inside and probing and, uh, and uh, uh, finding interest and learning about one's mind. But it's also creating certain uh, strengths and resources that are helping also in this investigation of universal truths. Like mind, but the mindfulness that has a certain strength, that has a certain, at least at times, continuity. We won't expect to be mindful all day. We won't expect to be mindful for the whole sitting moment by moment. There are gaps. But there might be certain stretches where we really more and more of the days can see what's going on quite effortlessly. And maybe it's just a few seconds, but it can be very valuable seconds. And the next time it's a little bit more. Another time it might be a little bit more. And this doesn't work with pressure. It's just an as I said, creating conditions, like remembering to be, be mindful again and again. And just having a short walk outside, I observed something in my mind and that was how I switched from just being normally out and just somehow somewhere in my mind lost somewhere and then there comes this thought, oh, I'm in a retreat. 
<laughs> and in that moment, I think, oh, I'm in retreat. Oh, now, ah, oh. oh. Now, and in that moment, mindfulness was there, and I was just seeing trees and seeing the, uh, 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 and, and, and seeing that path. And I'm feeling the steps. And I thought, ah, it's a strange concept. Being, do I need to be in retreat? Think I'm in retreat to be present. <laughs> so, but uh, it's a help, uh, and I think it's a help because the retreat is exactly there where you usually one is. So, probably also maybe after retreat, maybe a little bit of retreat, just retreat moments, still can be there. And we don't have to call it retreat. Actually, just now I heard about people who just see this whole situation. Uh, we are in in Italy, same like in Austria and like in probably maybe also in Switzerland, of where we're so restricted and everything has come to a halt or many things. There are some people who have much more work to do, but there are some people, quite a number of people, who are somewhat like on a retreat. And some even seem to start thinking, oh, actually, I don't really wait for that it is changing. <laughs> there is also something that uh, <coughs> one can... Uh, 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 that one can uh, appreciate in this slowness and and rather slowing down of everything. At least some people can do that. Anyway, so there are moments of mindfulness, or even on retreat, not all the time, but moments of mindfulness. And mindfulness may, might might get a bit more continuous, and it is here where uh, the inside practice can really take place. Because we don't think about something. It's not that inside practice is about that one should not think. It can be in presence of thinking, but it's not, the, but thinking is not the medium that lets the wisdom arise. It's more just a direct observation of the phenomena, physically and mental phenomena. So, when we speak of wisdom in the Buddhist context, the word is panya uh, in the Pali language, and, and this signifies wisdom in a very specific way. And actually, there is a distinction between three kinds of wisdom. One, which is called the Sutta Maya Panya, which means, Sutta means hearing. Or it can also mean reading now. So it's, or the knowledge that comes from reading and hearing. Hearing Dhamma talks, reading Dhamma books, or other. So that's more on the intellectual level, of course. But it's not the kind of wisdom that really sinks into the heart. So another kind of wisdom that is called uh, the wisdom of reflection. Chittamaya Banya, Panya. We hear something, we read something, we reflect about it, and we connect it through reflection with our own life, with our own experience. Ah, that gets a bit closer. But that's still not that kind of wisdom that Vipassana is actually concerned with. It's concerned with the third kind of wisdom, which is called bhavana maya panya, bhavana, the development, development of the mind, development of the heart, wisdom that comes from mental, 
but it very much signifies what is called so-called intuitive insight. And intuitive insight is not something that suddenly it comes something to your mind and you say, ah. Just through observing and it doesn't have to be a big bang or something. Uh, several teachers have written about intuitive insight. What is meant by it? I'll start with one. Oh, it's in German. So I, I try to translate it. It's by Joseph Goldstein, which is originally in English, but I translate. So insight in insight meditation is intuitive, but not conceptual. Intuitive in this sense means not to have a vague feeling regarding something. Clear and direct seeing and experiencing as things are. For example, you sit in meditation and you observe the breath and suddenly the mind kind of rests in just a certain own space. And if it's just for some moments, so may, you may feel a deeper kind of peace and calmness. Rather than fighting to be with the breath, you just start to be with the breath in a very calm and effortless way. This is insight through direct experience in the characteristic of peace and stillness. You don't think about it. You don't reflect about it. You know that daffodils are yellow because you have seen them. You know the characteristic of peace and calmness because you have felt it in your heart. And so there are many such experiences and many levels of each. And every time when we uh, experience them directly, it is like we would open to a new kind of seeing, a new kind of being, because you feel it. And this is insight. But very often our mind gets so excited with every new experience so that we start thinking, oh, look at that, I'm so calm. And this is great. And then what happens? <laughs> that was calmness. And, uh, or uh, we start thinking, just thinking and reflecting about impermanence or about suffering uh, or whatever the, in, the sp specific insight was. And so we have to take care to see the difference. What is direct experience and what is the reflecting about. And so it even can go the opposite way that we are having experiences, very clear direct experience of intuitive insight. And after that, we start reflecting about it. That's something also very natural because it's a kind of digesting something. We want to put it into our system somewhere. No, what, what was this about? We want to uh, understand also on a more intellectual way. And uh, <clears throat> so it is something important. However, it's also important not to get lost in it or it's important to see the difference. What is the thinking about and what is the direct experience? What is the thinking about calmness and stillness and what is the direct experience of calmness and stillness? What is the thinking about experience of anger? And often we're analyzing and so on, but that's not the direct experience. The direct experience is what I yesterday said or this morning, oh, anger feels like this. Ah. Anger feels like this. Ah, peace or stillness of mind feels like this. That's direct experience. But now I say it feels like this. This is already more than that. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but it points into this direction. Okay. 
So what else about this inside practice? There are a few other teachers who also have some interesting quotes about intuitive insight. Uh, but I should leave this for a moment because it's, I think it's already uh, concerned about the uh, experience of the so-called universal characteristics like impermanence, change, for example. So you have to look at something else first. Another distinction. What happens in Vipassana practice is that in the beginning, uh, beginning quite for a time, uh, and again and again, the attention goes to certain objects. It's the primary object, like rising and falling, for example. But other objects that arise, certain sensations, certain kind of uh, emotions. And we learn to know them, we learn to distinguish them, we really can observe with a clear perception. And what we do then is what is called, we see the specific characteristic. Specific characteristic, for example, like, ah, anger is like this, sadness is like this. Ah, this is like joy feels. And of course, there can be many different types of joy, but somehow we tend to experience it very directly with mindfulness, with awareness. And this is why we can say, oh, this is joy, and this is more the calm, happiness, and this is more just this, uh, uh, calmness, or maybe even equanimity or whatever. or specific characteristics of certain sensations. And we can say, oh, this is heat. Heat feels like this. Oh, this is kind of stabbing sensation. It is an itching. Oh, how does itching feel? Have you observed itching without reacting? Just having interest. Oh, how does itching feel? Is this a very permanent sensation or is it a very flickery sensation? And is it painful or is it just unpleasant? There is a difference. Maybe it's just so yeah, unpleasant, but maybe not really painful. Ah, this is how itching is like. And maybe in this itching, there is some other element. It's a kind of piercing maybe or something. Ah. So different characteristic or mental states like the mind is clear. Another time the mind is like a bit blurred or, or it is uh, stiff. Sometimes meditators, and already I heard that, are also able to see not just different characteristics of physical sensations, but also of the mind. One meditation, the mind is quite movable and it can follow objects. Another time it's stiff, it's just stiff and doesn't go here, doesn't go there. It's just kind of stiffness often in the body and also in the mind. And then, well, nothing you can do, but you can experience stiffness. That's a specific characteristic. Later is a time when mindfulness gets a certain momentum of continu continuity, also the universal characteristics start, start to shine out. And I will speak about them a little, little later. First, these quotes regarding intuitive insight by Aya Kema, a German nun who lived in Australia and Sri Lanka and then later in Germany and uh, was very well known there. She writes about intuitive, intuitive insight or 
and knowing based on experience. And that is different from intellectual knowledge. And then she writes, it, in a way it penetrates the whole body. We see not just with the intellect, but also with the body, with the sensations. It's a kind of embodying, embodiment. It is a knowledge we can remember along at any time, like imprinted in this body-mind continuum. There is no need to discuss with others about how true this knowledge is, because as we know, the other person first also has to make this experience. Through debating, the truth is neither seen nor confirmed. And then, Venerable Mahasi Sayada, and we know uh, also uh, a lot of the teachings at Pian de Cileci are somehow rooted in this tradition of the Venerable Mahasi Sayada in Burma. He writes, one may intellectually understand impermanence. On the other hand, uh, sorry, one may intellectually understand impermanence on the one hand, but one's subconscious may cognize it as permanence on the other. Or notes suffering, but thoughts of happiness keep turning up. Or meditates on non-self, but the self remains strong and firm. So, when it comes to experience of what's called universal characteristica, it needs repetition. It's not, and it's not, as I said, through just thinking, but it needs observation. And the mind needs to be ready. You cannot force it. So, in a way, uh, one could also speak of certain kinds of development that takes place in meditation and also in a meditation retreat. Observing something, experiencing something, and the mind reacts to it. It reacts with liking, with dislike, and so on. And it can be <laughs> relatively disconcerting sometimes to see how reactive there is the mind. And it can be also disconcerting to see uh, how active the mind is and how little one can uh, by will uh, just uh, uh, control it. And here there is a very important part of learning. Can we at times come to a point where the observation is free of like and dislike and judging. It's just being with whatever there is. And I've heard already in interviews that meditators got this difference, like meditating with an agenda, kind of, or with some kind of wanting for something or whatever. And then, a moment or even more than moments of the just simple presence of whatever there is and seeing this difference and knowing and seeing this difference makes it also easier to again see and observe when the mind is reactive because we we have some contrast we usually this is how it is we don't know anything else. But once experiencing this just simple observing present kind of being, ah, it feels like some tension has gone or something because the, the clinging has partly gone or the wanting and not wanting and so on. Just being with things. Several meditators have uh, <clears throat> uh, reported that. Of course, it comes back, but it's important. And as long we don't get it, that we ju can just be and observe, we don't have to change anything. We don't have to understand anything. 
We don't have to analyze everything. We don't anything. We don't have to do anything with the experience. It's just stopping and being with it as it is. Ah, and that can be quite freeing. And it is necessary to really look deeper to see what is truth, or to come to the point where vipassana becomes true vipassana because vipassana is often defined as seeing things as they are and not as we want them to be. But in the beginning, it's always seeing as we want it to be. Hmm. Stepping back, ah, see it as it is. Hmm. So, there's a beautiful text by the sixth, no, by the third patriarch of Chan. Chan is the Zen. Before it was Zen, it was in China, and there it's called Chan. This kind of highlights this not judging mind and just being present with whatever there is. And he writes, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When like and dislike are both ab absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. When the deep meaning of things is not understood, the mind's essential is disturbed unnecessarily. The way is perfect like vast space, where nothing is lacking and nothing is in excess. Indeed, it is due to our choosing to accept or reject that we do not see the true nature of things. So, moments of just being present with whatever there is. And then, this is already quite a very, very good, more than a basis. It's very, this is, uh, <coughs> we are already a good step. Another thing that, uh, mm, gets more clear after some days and then more and more and more with the practice is that practitioners more and more can distinguish what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is a mental state that is worth developing, what are mental states that are not worth developing because we can distinguish different mental states and we see what it does with us how they are, uh, 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 what are their effects, what seems to be helpful, what creates more suffering, less suffering. We have also experienced the so-called five hindrances that are usually something that when we experience it mindfully, we, think, we will see that, oh, well, it's not something that I want even more of. Especially when one experiences the absence of them, because then often the wholesome states arise. And this is the moment where one might be able to, without fighting, be present with the meditation object, or where some calmness arises, or some sense of peace arises, or some sense of joy arises. And it's not the joy because you can have an ice cream. It's a joy that comes from inside. It comes out from presence and of the practice. But of course, joy 
of an ice cream even in these times is not to underestimate <laughs> but uh, uh, this wholesome joy that comes from the inside is uh, uh, also not something to underestimate it can be very nourishing but we can't uh, push it it is it, it it is developing in its own pace. Ah, and then it can show, ah, there's something to, to uh, I can, uh, to appreciate. On the other hand, of course, one might not cling to it because also to the wholesome, the unwholesome and the wholesome states, one uh, should be on the observing side. We are, on this endeavor of developing wisdom. We might see the specific characteristics also of the wholesome states of like calmness or uh, joy or an inner happiness or clear mind. But it's also necessary to step farther and that's to look into the universal characteristic. And this doesn't happen by will, but also just when the time is ripe. And so it can be interesting at times and would uh, encourage you to sometimes do that, to see in the more clear moments. It can be sometimes clearly seen regarding thoughts. When the thoughts are arising, are you able to see the thoughts when they arise or it takes some time and then you are aware of it? So probably the thought has already arisen, it's going on and then you're aware of it. So being aware while it is there. And then what happens with it? Can you see how it is fading away or stopping or is it that while this thought is there, another thought comes or some other sense impression comes? Or is it at times that one is seeing something popping up, an image or a thought, and then it's shortly there, and then it passes away? So that's a different thing. Or sometimes one sees something popping up, could be a sound and it's shortly there and then immediately a thought pops up or an image pops up and it is there and then an emotion pops up and it is there. So even if objects are changing but moment by moment we can see it, this is a series of mindfulness continuum of mindfulness. And here the elements of what is called the arising presence and passing away of objects is at least partly seen and we don't think about it. We see ah, oh, something arises out of nothing or it arises because it's connected with what happened just before. For example, <laughs> uh, I was just before in my meditation hut and then I hear in front of my hut a dog. No, I hear a sound. I didn't hear the dog. I hear a sound. The sound was arising. The next moment was, oh, this is a dog. And then there was some kind of tension in the body, like a slight moment of fear. Oh, I don't know what kind of dog. What does the dog do here? So one after the other, a sound, then the image that the perception, oh, this is a dog. Usually it's just birds, but now it's a dog. And then some reaction to it. So one after the other. And with mindfulness, we can see these chains of cause and effect. This the sound in this moment was the cause for kind of getting some tension.
regarding physical sensations sometimes they are already there we are aware of them and they look like just one block of sensation another time it looks like vibrating or not being really continuous so also here uh, universal characteristica of change of impermanence of arising and passing might be in some ways uh, present so now the third phase of the practice if i would say after seeing more and more what is wholesome and what is unwholesome is uh, get more and more to see universal characteristica and here there is a slight difficulty and the difficulty is that we are often very attached to the objects and to the contents of the objects especially for example thinking the content of the thinking and being attached to the content one doesn't see what is called the process and the process is important the process of oh, it arises it's there it passes so an example once i was in a retreat and i did walking meditation quite far away from my room and from the meditation hall and doing the walking meditation there the mind got very very sharp and and I could observe a lot of sensations while walking and with this sharp and open mind and this is how it often happens creativity came in and a lot of ideas came in you might observe this too it's also a development in practice often in the beginning thoughts are more chaotic they do not really have any connection with each other it's like popping up boom, boom, boom. after some time it may change and there is maybe a little less but they are concerning certain topics at other times it might be more that there are thoughts but they are concerned with what you're observing at the moment like one meditator once would call it oh this is uh, <clears throat> The, how do you call it, reporter? Hmm. Uh, a journalist, yeah, and when there is some soccer match, there is always this person who is talking, ah, oh, now so and so is passing the ball to so and so, and, and so on. <laughs> and in this way, the mind is commenting on what is going on in the practice or at other times and this happened at that time there was space arising in the mind and there was so very good ideas very creative ideas and then of course grasping for these ideas but i couldn't write them down so i was really really concerned that i will forget them because these ideas they would change my life <laughs> and at some point at some point i risked that I would forget them and I just noted them as uh, thinking and they pass away. And being so clinging to content, one overlooks something that is so simple. Even these thoughts arise and pass away and no control whether they come back or whatever and it's important in Vipassana to, to stay on this observing side so sometimes we need to risk to <laughs> forget something but see even how thoughts arise pass away or with emotions how they are changeable like guests like I read this morning sometimes they may stay for a long time the other parts of the practice when it getting kind quite fluid mindfulness is quite 
uh, uh, continuous, one, one may be able to see, oh, it arises, it's there, but it changes, it passes. It's not so solid as it looks. Even sadness or whatever, what looks like oh, permanent, it's not so permanent. And it's not because we reflect about it, but because we really see it. Of course, we can do this, not only in formal practice, but we can observe this also in daily activities and in life. So, the Buddha was speaking about three universal characteristics and it's not a wise thing to start to talk about them five minutes before end of the Dhamma talk. <laughs> so, uh, maybe another time. But uh, I would still suggest to have some observation of how objects arise or pass away or change or sometimes seemingly do not change and are just solid and there rather than getting caught again and again only in the content. So at the end to show, uh, of this Dharma talk to uh, show this difference of reflecting and getting into content or the pure observation. One story that uh, happened in Burma. And I do not say that analytical thinking is worthless. It's very, it can be very, very useful. And also uh, one might use it in therapy or so. But here Vipassana is concerned with this direct observation and there might be reflecting about it, but one should first really more and more uh, <clears throat> aim to the direct observation. So the typical story that illustrates that is that of a psycho, uh, uh, I think psychoanalytic, a person who is uh, practicing psychoanalysis. And he uh, practiced with a Burmese monk and teacher, Sada Upandita. And Sada Upandita usually wanted to know in the, uh, when one would meet him, what one observed with the rising and falling. This was the most important to him. Every day, every day you don't, you can't imagine every day rising and falling. <laughs> but with the time, more and more one can observe there as well. And then of course also other objects what happened. So this person would report, oh, I observed rising and falling and then while observing rising and falling, there came, uh, I remembered something something that I didn't remember for a long time, something from childhood. And then he started to talk about, ah, and why this, uh, what he remembered now from childhood is so important to him because now he understands a lot about his behavior and so on and so on. And then this teacher, Sara Upantito, interrupted him and asked, this, images from the childhood, did they arise while rising of the abdomen or while falling of the abdomen? So that was the only thing that he was interested in. He was interested in process and not in content. So again, here it can be a very interesting, uh, these uh, also reflective insights, but we need to see the difference and uh, uh, also uh, withstand this drawing often into content.
content. And this is why noting is important because we note processes. You say just thinking, thinking or seeing, seeing and not the content. You can see past life experience, but you would know that just seeing, seeing. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, about a universal characteristic of change. And you know, very, very important is also the word universal, because it's something we can observe in everything. Of course, we can observe it in life, but when we look into body and mind, this change becomes more and more obvious. In the beginning, one thinks change happens just sometimes, but really looking deep, it's happening every moment. It's like every moment is a new birth and every moment is a new death. So I uh, st strongly want to encourage to uh, look and find some interest in that and sometimes be concerned about the contents or about the specific characteristics of objects, but at times also see what happens with it. That's also a question that the meditation teacher sometimes asked, asks in the interview, if you report something, some experience, and then questions, what happened to it? What happened to the anger? What happened to uh, the itching on the nose? probably at some point it changed or disappeared or got stronger or got less or whatever. So I think that's enough for today and it's exactly eight so it's a good point to stop. So